All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Antushi Thamilzern. Hi, I'm Akshika Pradeeman. And this is our presentation on Thamil Elam issues. So the forgotten identity. And here's why we call it that. Thamil Elam is a proposed independent state that Thamils in Sri Lanka and the Sri Lankan Thamil diaspora aspire to create in the north and east um, province of Sri Lanka. This province was pre-existing uh, pre until the British influence. And now um, as issues tend to progress, we want to create this independent state for the peace of both worlds. All right, pass now to Akshika. So Sinhalese makes up around like 74% of the population, as you can see, and Sri Lankan Tamils make up the 12.6%. The rest is usually burgers, Indian Tamils, et cetera. So, um, so the original settlers are obviously the Sinhalese, which is why they make up most of the population. And Sinhalese had occupied most of Sri Lanka and pre-Civil War time, there was a lot of kings and royal families which governed these re regions of this, of this land. And so the Sinhalese people, though they were the majority, lived peacefully with the non-Aryan populations of the island. And so the Sri Lankan Tamils, on the other hand, were originated from the southern part of India. Uh, various tribes from southern India invaded and settled in the northern parts of the island, spreading down the north, east, and northwest coasts. Um, due to the differences in religion and language, the intentions over land rights, the Tamil Kingdom of Jaffna was often at war with Sinhalese kings. And so, essentially, like there was always conflict between Sinhalese and Tamils um, before the war had even started. And I feel like the war had essentially established a major conflict that no one was expecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely created a conflict that like won't really be erased. It's a d prominent tension that still continues to go through even modern generations too. Yeah, and even though they say like the war is over, it doesn't feel it, like it's over. It's not over because to this day, there's constant discrimination. Um, there's so many things not being put out in the media because the government has full control. Right. And uh, one thing I want to say is that like, we're not saying that all Sinhalese people are like this. We're just saying that the government's like this because yeah. there are good Sinhalese people. There are bad Tamil people. And I'm not saying whatever, everything that Tamils did was justified, mm -hmm. but not everything the Sinhalese did was also justified. Right, yeah, definitely. There's definitely, a, it's, it's not black and white. It's, it's def there's really definitely not. gray areas created within these struggles, but as both of us are um, part of this diaspora, we wanna um, attempt to give a more neutral point of view, but also try to fight for what um, we where we've been silenced, so yeah. yeah. And I think it's also like important to notice, sorry, but I think it's important to notice that we aren't here for the political aspect of it because there's so many different views and values within the Tamil people and the Sinhalese people on this conflict. Um, and there are so many people involved and so many things happening that I can't put a blame on anyone. But the reason why we're wanting to talk about it is because the Tamil people are in need of humanitarian aid, which is what they are not receiving. The United Nations failed to do so. So the only way to bring it out there is if we raise awareness. Right, definitely. This is our goal is to create an educational safe space for us to teach you about our identity and how our identity tends to struggle over the years. So yeah, now we're gonna give you some historical context to first get into it. This is some background on why this st struggle kind of exists right now. So the historical context, so Sri Lanka and for was formerly Ceylon and Elam and has been, um, has been colonized. Um, sorry, my bad guys. Um, has been colonized by many, including the Dutch, Portuguese, and British. Um, Thamil Elam was a separate state until the British merged them with the Sinhalese for convenience. 
And under the British colonial rule, Singles saw the double minority as being heavily favored. So when they, so when the British left, the Singhalese majority took over. And so that led to a lot of bitter resentment among the two groups, probably. And, it can, and that resentment still carries on today as we both have talked about right now. Um, it's not just a historical struggle, the struggle continues on even just until modern day right now. So yeah, I'm gonna pass it off to Akshika again. So essentially what the conflict is. So there are, there's a group called the Thummel Tigers where essentially the full name is LTTE Liberation Thummel Tigers, Th Liberation Tigers of Thummel Elam and the Sinhalese, which is obviously the majority. And so the conflict with it, between them has grown over the years. They've been fighting for centuries and one day signified that the only way to solve this issue between the two groups is through war. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty much between the Buddhists versus the Hindus, um, the other cultural groups, religious groups, I should say, weren't as involved, nor were the other cultural groups like the burgers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was pretty much just an essential domestic problem. So. Right, yeah. I definitely, by creating this like Sinhalese Buddhist or like kind of defining Sri Lanka as a certain thing, you kind of deny its multi-ethnic character. And I think that's like a huge problem that like now we're seeing it as like, you're merging consciousness for only the majority group, but you're not giving any um, room for the minority group to discuss anything. And so like essentially, yeah, so we'll see that the Thummels had started off by asking, well, they proposed obviously from the first slide, we saw that they wanted a independent state. Um, it wouldn't be like a separate country, but like, the state as in how we see California compared to the United States. Right. Um, so they wanted an independent state for themselves to call their own, like how we see in India, every language has its own barrier and it has its own state, which like how the Tamil people in India have a state called Tamil Nadu, the Gujaratis have a state called Gujarat, Punjabis have Punjab like that, we wanted our own state called Tamil Elam for us Tamils to call our home. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, however, oh, sorry. Um, it definitely <laughs> just creates that sort of barrier that like we'll have something that we can own and say that can't be really easily taken away from us. Like you'll see like later in the slides that like things end up getting taken from us or destroyed. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, I think you might be wondering why we didn't get the state. It's because, I mean, the chances that the, I feel like the San Jose government was scared that we might rebel and form our own country or our own nation, which left them, which they needed us for resources and all that stuff, obviously. So they were definitely against it, but a rebellion had happened, which you'll see in the next slide. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go to the next slide, Joe it over. So Thummel Tigers and who are they and what do they want? So Liberation Thummel Tigers Elam is an organization founded in May 1976 and the leader is Velupale uh, Prabhakaran and it wants to achieve an independent Thummel, Thummel state solely for the Thummel population and that means gaining control of the northern and north and eastern province of Sri Lanka. And so initially they were listed as a terrorist organization among the, I think the, the like um, the UN, um, which was because they attempted to achieve their aims through violence and societal based landmarks and the use of illegal weapons to inflict terror on citizens was definitely seen as a threat. And yeah, yeah, they didn't immediately go towards peaceful protests. They assumed more violence was included, but it's now important to note that they're not listed as terrorists anymore. And after for, for the consideration as they were not um, immediately, like as further consideration was definitely put in and they were taken off that list. So that's just very important to know right there. Any thoughts, Sachika? Yeah, um, yeah, so I think 
Um, I just want to add that one reason why they're marked as a terrorist organization was because after the attacks of 9-11 on the United States, obviously they wanted to make as many restrictions as possible to make sure a, another attack like so wouldn't happen. So because the government had restricted any information going anywhere, they the whole world had saw the Dhamma people as terrorists because of the lack of information given to them. And because of that, a lot of people weren't actually able to flee to um, these places when they really needed to, to mm. seek like safety. Um, and that had caused a major issue within the people itself. So I thought that was important to know. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think that's something we need to talk about too. All right, I'm gonna move on to Black July, which is an important event in this history lesson, I guess. So like I said before, um, there's one date that signified the starting of this 26 year long civil war. Mm -hmm. So Black July had started by the leader of the LTTE, the Lupule Prabaharan, who had killed 13 Sinhalese soldiers. And in response to that, 3,000 Tamils were killed. Um, this had caused a major war. And even though it's, they say it ended in 2009, to this day, the Tamil people are still discriminated. And like, I, like the 2019 Easter bombing, which had popped over in all sources of media. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just one of the hundreds of attacks that have happened since 2009, which go unnoticed. Right. Yeah, definitely. I know the 2019 Easter bombings have definitely shocked um, a lot of people worldwide because that was like one of the main events that was getting released on that day, especially since it was Easter and it was a church um, that was included in the bombing. Um, but I know when I heard about it, I was definitely scared for my family members. I wasn't sure what was going on either because there wasn't much re um, information released after that so you're left in a little state of confusion and like scared like you're just worried what what's going to happen next and definitely sh and this this event definitely marks that this tension wasn't over that there's more um like tensions between us that need to be solved out and sorted any other thoughts you want to add on no, no. all right Let's go on to our next one. So the status quo, let's get into that. So as of right now, um, the Thummel Memorial was, um, as of earlier this year, the Thummel Memorial was destroyed. Um, on the night of January 8th, um, Sri Lankan authorities made their way onto the University of Jaffna campus, which is in the North province of Sri Lanka and used um, bulldozers to destroy a memorial, which was erected within the university grounds. The Mule Vakka um, Memorial was erected at the university, to, um, but this was used to remember that the hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians who were brutally killed in the final battles of the 2009 Civil War. And university students had definitely protested in response to this act upon the next day. But in response, armed forces were stationed at the university and had arrested them for merely even questioning this unjustifiable action. And so, yeah, so this action was definitely um, hard to hear at the beginning of the year. So, and, and it goes to show that again, like this is still going on. Nothing has really changed since the ending of that war and taking away this sort of um, monument really hurts because it shows that they're trying to erase parts of the war that happened and silence people's voices by taking out important structures to show that their struggle wasn't real. It kind of hurts a little bit to see it go. You can go ahead and add on if you want. Okay, so I think it's also important to notice that the reason why they had this monument is also because many kids within the ages of 18 to 22, which is typically the ages that people go to university, has joined the LTTE forces, not for political reasons, but just to keep us safe. They had, risk their education their chances of going to going um to america or you know a lot of people had those aspirations back there at home i feel like many of us are aware of that but um 
you know, they'd risk their lives just so that we could feel safe in where, wherever we were. Um, and the fact that they felt the need to bulldoze the one memorial we had to remember those kids who had joined the forces. It's, it's just, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's really hard. <laughs> It's not a moment we want to remember. And so that's why it definitely was built just so that we always remember, keep that in our heart, that people sacrifice to their daily lives just to get, just to continue this language and just to continue the fight for an independent state and seeing it removed is like a step back. Like we've already, we've already had fought a lot. And it was just another um, thing kind of taken away from us. It's almost as if like we're never going to stop fighting but even if we never stop fighting it comes with the cost of them not fighting back so yeah definitely all right I'm gonna move on to another recent event that has happened so the cultural erasure part of it so the Tamil National Alliance leader um as Yogi Swaran um, highlighted in the Sri Lankan parliament that many Hindu temples in the north and east province, which is Tamil Elam territory, were damaged during military operations. Um, we see that 500 temples were deliberately destroyed by military forces. Um, and even though he only listed 500, um, tem the temples um, and at the temple like registration, uh, restore restoration society listed that was at least 2,076 temples destroyed. And noting that the most uh, unforgivable part of this is the vandal vandalism and disfigurement of the third eye located on the icon of Siva. So this repeated action can definitely be seen as a deliberate systemic way to conduct cultural um, genocide of Elam Tamils. And it's really, this one was one that I took a while to uncover and I didn't really see it until it came up on social media. So yeah, any thoughts would add on? Yeah, on. so not only did they burn these temples and destroy them, there's also the Jaffna Library. The Jaffna Library held the oldest scriptures, the oldest scriptures, and they have the Tamil language, and the Tamil language is the oldest language standing to this day. They found the need to burn the remains we had of Tamil literature calculus all these things that were reported beforehand in Tamil history and it it really you know showed that they want I mean the Sinhalese essentially wanted to erase our culture but you know in a way erasing both the culture and our history it it took a huge toll on the way that the Tamils had reacted to the situation yeah. because it was the oldest scriptures that were being held to this day, being burned. Yeah, I don't know. By destroying Hindu Tamil temples too, it just really shows that taking out a specific, like taking out a specific sector too can really um, impact us because it, it is um, traditionally, um, Hindus tend to be Tamil and um, Sinhalese tend to be um, Buddhist due to, it's, it's that's a more traditional aspect to face. There are Sinhalese that are um, Hindu and it goes both ways definitely, but that there is that divide. So I do want to um, point that out if, uh, for all you all that are listening, that there is normally that's how the religions ended up shaping around those two languages. So this specific act is definitely a more targeted approach to um, destroying, like by destroying and damaging temples, it's a more targeted attack to Elam Tamil heritage. So yeah, I'm gonna take it on to the next slide. So um, we talked about a few current issues going on in Sri Lanka, but I think a few that are important to notice is like, to this day, there's serious human rights violations going on, such as abductions, arrests and detentions and sexual violence. Um, and this is all going from the former conflict zone. Um, and these areas still continue to be heavily militari militarized and they're controlled 
that are essentially controlled like civil societies activity in these areas. Um, you know, there's a huge military presence and I feel like to this day, the Tamil culture and like freedom of expression has like been marginalized to a major extent. And like after, you know, repressive policies and like by the government, um, they saw that like these religious practices were like prohibited and their heritage should be destroyed. Um, and so I feel like these problems like persist to like, you know, this day with the con continuing militarization um, and, you know, in minority Sinhalese areas, they would purposely, you know, send the Sinhalese to live there just to overtake the area and call it a Sinhalese majority, um, majority like neighborhood even like in simple neighborhoods, they would do this kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they would reconstruct Hindu temples into Buddhist shrines um, to vic like, and showcase it as a victory monument that like affirms the Sinhalese control. Yeah, I definitely see. And like with the UN now, they're not really paying attention to a lot of like human rights violations that the Sri Lankan government tends to enforce. And so by not checking off these violations, we're not getting any aid, we're not getting any help. And that's what like their main issue is. We need people to start hearing our voices. We need people to start listening and understanding and attempting to create change in any way they can. And so that's like one main thing that we're the um, UN's support of not just Sri Lanka, there are other countries that are definitely not getting um, UN support as well. Um, but just to focus on Sri Lanka specifically, by getting, not getting UN support, we're also a small nation. So we don't have that much um, power or um, control of uh, over other nations to start um, influencing or spreading our word. So this is the main way we can through educational purposes. Any and additional I, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's important to notice that one of the major Tamil genocides that occurred was due to the United Nations fail to understand both sides of the story. They got the biased um, view of the Sri Lankan government without talking to any Tamil Tigers, um, people from the Tamil Tigers essentially. And um, this had led them to allow the Sinhalese to unjustifiably attack us thinking that we had already received humanitarian aid. Um, I feel like they knew this was coming forth and many people had reported saying that this, the United Nations was well aware of the attacks about to happen but they never did anything to do help. So I feel like we can't rely on these supranational organizations. Um, and I think like the Tamils feel like their last hope is to just bring awareness uh, by starting hunger strikes in the UK, um, several riots, I mean, not riots, but peaceful protests, sorry, peaceful protests in Canada especially in Toronto, because there's a major Tamil population there. Um, and, you know, these little things in Sacramento. Yeah, definitely. I feel like with also with that, like we have a really strong um, like community here in Sacramento um, that we tend to, as both of us tend to rely on. And it is hard, though, to get information out of our parents um, as it, it, it does bring up a lot of trauma to talk about um, the war or like any sort of aspect of tension uh, between the Sinhalese and Tamil. Um, but I know, I do both know that my parents do follow up um, to try to find information about Sri Lanka uh, to just to keep, keep up with them and see how their like family members are doing too. All right, I'm gonna take it on to the next slide where we talk about the urgency. So why do we need to fight now? Okay, so like many of you guys know by now, the Sri Lankan government has a lot of control over what goes on. Um, so one of the most recent things that have happened around a month ago, um, and I feel like this hasn't really affected just the people living in Sri Lanka, but it's affected pretty much every single Tamil globally. Um, they had erased the two hashtags, the two most prominently used hashtags by the Tamils. Hashtag Tamil Elam and hashtag Elam. Um, they said it was, you know, 
it was pretty much used um, to silence our voices. And, you know, um, I think this act pretty much shows the urgency the government has to erase our culture. Um, but I personally think that simply a Instagram hashtag has left the Sri Lankan government scared of what our community, I would say, can um, essentially say to the outside world because we know the truth more than anyone else does. Yeah. Our people know what, what was going on more than anyone else does because they were the ones who were discriminated. They were the ones that saw what was going on. They were the ones who essentially were in the situation. Um, and whatever has been spread to mainstream media is all false accusations, false statements, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definite. I feel like we don't always know and we won't always get the like neutral side of, um, of this issue. It's always like a flip of the coin, like whether you get one or the other and it will always tend to be um, misfires too. Um, but specifically by not, by um, Instagram taking down Thummel Elam and Elam hashtags, it is an act of silencing and it not only like um, like targets just people living at home, it does target people living on like other side of the globe. It's just not allowing to reach more viewers and it just attempts to um, push the like media away from thermal issues and try to make it focus on something else rather than the issue at hand. So that's something I definitely want to talk about later on too. All right, let's get on to our personal experience. So as you all may know, I'm uh, Sandoshi. I'm a senior at West Campus High School. I am graduating this year. And this is one of my close friends, um, Akshika Pradeeban. She is a sophomore at Vista Del Lago High School. And she has kindly joined me today um, to do this presentation. Anything you want to say now? Um, yeah, I've decided to raid and talk about this issue because I think it's important. And I am so thankful to be given this opportunity, actually, because like I think it's important and it's really nice to know that other people are willing to learn about, you know, Tamil Elam. And it makes me really happy. Um, to be able to spread awareness about what's going on. Oh yeah, for sure. So shout out to Dr. Bersher for letting us have this opportunity as well. So now to get on a little bit more to Akshika's story. Well, like we all know, the government had restricted any outside knowledge. And I feel like many of us Sri Lankan Tamil Americans or Canadians or, you know, Germans, we were all in like put in the same shoes. We weren't taught much about our you know we were, we didn't really know who we were what our identity was because you know we weren't allowed to call ourselves Sri Lankan but Tamil Yilam never existed so it was like when I looked at the map I was kind of like well where am I where do I come from um and you know it was always that like missing identity where at a point I wanted to call myself like Indian because I was able to relate to those people more than my own people and you know it was like a constant conflict for myself and you know to this day I still feel that way and I feel like it's going to take a while to change but I think the community that we formed in Sacramento has really helped me to learn our culture and like you know it, it they really made me like learn how you know beautiful it is and how beautiful it's always been and even though we went through all these hardships um you know we should keep our culture alive because being one of the speaking one of the oldest languages standing to this day actually the oldest language standing to this day I mean it's a huge thing it's and it, being a part of a beautiful religion and you know having so many having a community that comes together and we all have something and we all share this thing in common. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. And, you know, I feel like hearing the few people that tell us their stories 
it it, it brings us closer yeah. I feel like I mean I feel like the, sh- the Tamil community has something that many communities don't have because we all have seen the pain that everyone's been through and it's brought us closer together which I think is very important yeah I definitely can say the same um it's definitely I hate to say it but like the trauma has brought us closer together as a whole community parents are a little bit more reliable on each other as going forward too and this community definitely shaped me to who I am today for sure I'm gonna go into my intro so yeah when I was younger I really didn't understand the idea of being Tamil first and Sri Lanka second um I'd always I would always be um told, told by my parents like go by Tamil you are Tamil first you are um, Tamil's what your identity is but I never really understood that since they never really took the time to explain it to me when I was younger and it was definitely harder since they were not really open about sharing the struggles for when they fleed before the um, civil war but now that I'm older I'm going through media outlets trying to find information on this war but again has been limited and um, and as someone who has struggled with their identity growing up, being Tamil Elam gives me a sort of strength. It shows me that like it's the longest um, surviving language and we are able to fight back and keep the language going, giving me a sense of hope and like the will to like learn more and use that language as often as I can. I'm extremely grateful to have um, the Sacramento Tamil Academy um, when I was growing up so that I could learn my home native language. And as much as I don't use it as, as much as I could, or like wish to, I am grateful for that education that I did get um, when I was in grade school. Uh, one thing I'd actually like to add is that, you know, Tamil is spoken in many countries, Singapore, India, Malaysia, you know, obviously Sri Lanka. Um, but the Tamil that we speak in Sri Lanka is the oldest, I would say, dialect of Tamil because you know, we never got along with the Sinhalese, so our Tamil is, like, known to be the purest Tamil, Mm -hmm. and um, I feel like in all these other countries, since they got along with the people around them, their cultures, you know, syncretize, like, went through, like, syncretism, I guess, Um, and, you know, yeah, they joined together, assimilate, yes, assimilation, (laughs) Um, and, you know, they formed, like, a different kind of Tamil, a different type of slang, but, you know, knowing that we speak the oldest type of Tamil, and, you know, it's only in Sri Lanka, it kind of, kind of pushed me to learn my language, to know more about my identity, you know, and I, and I feel like many of us, you know, second generation immigrants, um, we've never, or, you know, We've never found the need to learn our mother tongue, a lot of us, I feel like, Mm -hmm. Um, but this really amplified my reasoning to actually learn it because I want it to go on for futuristic generations and I want this culture to keep going on, Um, especially when we don't have a nation to call our own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I definitely want to talk about like how I, I was inclined to go by India first, like at a time. Because at the point, it was just for convenience. It was for people just to understand, like, uh, like India it has a huge um, prominence over the world. So it was just like, oh, like, I'm Indian. It would be an easier way to um, identify myself to others. So it um, made it more convenient for them. But I've le- realized that, like, my identity isn't something I can just give up. Um, it's not something I can just give away. It's someone. It's something that, like, people and generations have really struggled for and are continue to struggle for today. And so that's why giving, like, getting um, that understanding of being Tamil Elam gives me some sort of, um, like, will to continue to want to teach this language or continue wanting to speak this language with other people. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Um, I do want to say also, like, our community has given a lot to us. Um, they definitely given us opportunities that we don't have elsewhere we're kind of sheltered from a lot of the actual like um pain and um, trauma that uh, the people of the war have gone through and continue to go through so I do want to like thank them for like trying to um keep us safe and keep us protected and have us not be as involved but you know within us we want to advocate 
for what's right and what we believe in as students and people who are continuing to learn. I want to add on anything, Ashka? Yeah, I mean, like, like you said, like the Sacramento community, I mean, going home, if I ever wanted to go back to Sri Lanka, I don't have any relatives there. I mean, they either died in the war or they're somewhere else, mm-hmm. either in, that be in Germany, London, you know, Canada. Um, but, you know, going back home, if I were ever to go, I wouldn't be able to stay in a home. I wouldn't be able to like, you know, see the culture because I'd be stuck in some hotel or something. And I know that sounds like, it doesn't sound like a bad thing, but in a way, like, I'm never able to get the culture that I've wanted to have, but, you know, the small things that our community does, like, it makes us all so happy, and it's, like, we're so appreciative of what they do, like, it helps, it it just, like, helps us to know who we are, and, you know, I hope, I wish for this to continue for the future generations, um, but yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I definitely, I feel like this community has done a lot in a ways I don't even recognize sometimes, like even just having kotas where we just celebrate and eat kota together is honestly like exciting and important to me. Even um, I've never been to Sri Lanka my whole life. I wish I could have, but I was just never able to go. Um, so small events that they do like celebrating Bongol with everyone or celebrating Diwali with everyone kind of gives me that sense of home and sense of security that I like have other people that I share a culture with <laughs> and it's like exciting to be here. And I find it cute for us to like do small things like play volleyball together and yeah. like you know keep in touch because I feel like the relationship that we have with each other is something most people don't have with their communities. Mm-hmm. We're definitely like siblings in a way <laughs> we're all we're all a big group of siblings um that will constantly fight with each other but when it comes to issues like this we're always going to stand together and I think having that yeah. uh, sense of purpose and security keeps us together for hopefully more generations to come I hopefully we can stay together for years and sort of talk about these things more often um in our community and I know parents it's hard for them to talk about stuff like this can people are coming out with stories, but it's just harder um, and it's easier for them to shelter it all in. So yeah, anything you wanna add before we close it up? Yeah, so um, I, one thing I wanted to let you guys know was that like, I mean, I don't know about here, but like, even if we were able to like donate to these places, there isn't really much, like there's really not, many official organizations that go to the Thumble people. It's actually, most of them are Sinhalese owned and they use the trauma that the Thumble people went uh, uh, went through um, to collect these donations for themselves rather than giving them to the Thumble people. So like, if anyone was wondering, I mean, you can reach out to, I'm pretty sure Sandoshi, most of you guys probably know her. Um, but you can reach out to her and I'm pretty sure she'll be able to give you a few places yeah. to either help, like even a few, uh, like a simple signing a petition or something like that. Because, you know, recently um, in Canada, actually, I think it was yesterday, they had started something called Thumble Education Week, yeah. where they spend a week talking about the Thumble ed- genocide and educating those who live with him in the Toronto area um so you know signing small things like that really do so much and it'll mean so much to us so yeah yeah definitely so yeah if anyone wants to reach out please um do reach out to me I'll give you some resources and ways you can help um I haven't listed them here but definitely reach out um I'll definitely be open to answering anything like that and with that um, I want to thank thank you everyone for listening to our story and taking the time to uplift our voices. It is highly appreciated that you all can listen to us uh, um, talk about Thumble Elam issues. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. Um, DM me if you ever need, um, if you want to ever see um, ways for you to help and continue to uplift stories. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. We did it.